thank all of you coming out and ooh, sorry. This is the first time that they've done it all together. And so it's going to, are we on? Yeah, all right. So we're going to start with them all introducing themselves. And so we'll start here. I'm Kara Brookins. And as you heard, um, a few years ago, I went through a really bad domestic violence situation. And my four kids and I left. And we decided we would build a house by watching YouTube tutorials. Uh, we built a 3,500 square foot house uh, just south of here in Bryant. And this? I'm Roman. I was two when we were building the house. <laughs> I'm Jada. I was 11 when we built the house. I'm Hope. I was 17 when we built the house. I'm Drew. I was 15 when we built the house. So we're going to kind of go through a little conversation. We'll talk a little bit about, obviously, the process, and then hopefully we'll have some questions for y'all. Um, kind of the genesis for, for me of seeing it, Hope was here um, winning an award on this stage in December of 2008. And um, she won an award for outstanding um, leadership as a, as a high school student. Now, I followed Hope, and I've seen all the great work that she's done, and so saw the story and, and wanted her to bring. I did not realize that this was happening during that process. Um, and so they had just completed their house. And I found that out, obviously, after figuring out. So it's amazing. Um, she never once mentioned it in a, a high school service award application. I never knew about it. Um, she was an intern for the Clinton Foundation and still didn't ever know about it. So this is a little bit about them. Um, that It took a book. So it's a good marketing floor, I think, is what Hope did. <laughs> Kara, I start all these, though, talking about where people grew up. So tell me about where you grew up. I grew up in Toma, Wisconsin, and lived there until I was 14. So cheese country and very cold, very different than here. And then I moved to Searcy when I was 14 and graduated from high school there. What do you want to be? A mom. What is it, <laughs> success? It worked. <laughs> Did it? Um, you mentioned it, but what's Inkwell Manor? Obviously, I also wanted to be a writer when I wasn't being a mom. Um, Inkwell was where I wanted all of my books to come from, so I did name the house Inkwell Manor. I had planned to write a lot of books there, and I have. Why writing? Oh, I've always been a storyteller and a story listener. I, I asked my grandparents and my parents for stories constantly, and I was a voracious reader, always telling myself stories, too. I uh, want the kids to kind of take me back to Thanksgiving of 07. And so you guys take a little family vacation. Roman said he didn't want to talk, but he's got the microphone. <laughs> he's ready just in yeah. case. <laughs> Jada? Anybody want to tell him about Thanksgiving? Well, we <laughs> took a little family vacation. And by vacation, that was like a drive into the middle of nowhere to a cabin. Mm -hmm. And I drove part of the way. This part isn't in the book, but I drove part of the way and scared my siblings half to death. That was part of the scariest part of the vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't been driving very long. But yeah, it, it was a vacation that was not what you think of when you think of fun, get away. It was more like we're scared, let's get away, let's escape and hope no one finds us. And then I was at, now there's an important part of this vacation that if you've read the book you know about, but I was sleeping during that part, so, <laughs> in the car. Actually, they all were. <laughs> But you know the story. Um, I passed a house that had been broken by a tornado. And I stopped and just sort of looked inside of the wall of the house. And you know, you don't see inside very often to see how a house goes together. And it looked really simple. Um, you know, it was just a nail, and it was just some boards, and it was just a brick. It was all things I recognized. It wasn't foreign objects in there. And I thought, I could probably put that wall back up if I tried. And then from there, it was like, well, obviously, we can't live in this house. Um, and from there, it just went to, well, we could probably start from scratch if I bought the nails and the boards <coughs> and the brick. And I bet we could put it together. Um, it, I wasn't thinking immediately, we're going to do this. But the kids and I from there just sort of started fantasizing about it. And within just a couple of days, it was 
you'd built a model house out of sticks and yeah. twigs and glue and paper and everything around this rental house. Yeah, and that was just fantasy then. It was still just, oh, if we could build a house, what would we put in it? Drew, you took it home, you wrapped it up, made sure it was safe. Do you still have the model house? <laughs> it's gone. This wasn't something we had ever planned to but. share with anybody, <laughs> ever. I mean, like you said, we didn't tell anyone we had built a house. We were ashamed of what we were doing. Um, we were ashamed, I didn't plan to write a book about it. We were ashamed that we were in a position that that was our best option. To build our own shelter was our only option. Um, you know, I was ashamed that I had made bad decisions that had put my kids in this place and the things that they had to give up to be there. Uh, you know, they building a house, they weren't going to dances and, and going out to movies and on dates or working a summer job. They were building a house. So it was, you know, we were going through a lot emotionally. It wasn't something that we were saving mementos to share with you today. <laughs> but then when you do get back, and I think it was Jada, and said, like, we're really going to do this, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the, when, did, when did you all kind of accept that this was a real project slash we're doing this? <clears throat> she kind of mentioned, hey, let's try to build a house. And I was like, I know nothing about building a house. <laughs> so we started <clears throat> just Googling, YouTubing what was all involved in that process and thought we could do it. So we attempted. <laughs> and when you're 17, 16, 11, and 2, you trust your mom. They thought you I think, was sane. <laughs> you think that what she says is reasonable and that she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> she wouldn't do anything that would ever put you in danger, right? <laughs> so we all trusted her. <laughs> she didn't mention maybe the amount of work that it would take to build a house, though I'm sure she underestimated it too. She certainly didn't lead on even to what work she did know was involved. Sure, and I think that you know, for us, we were imagining the finished product. I mean, we were picking out the paint color and thinking of the curtains we were going to hang and thinking of hanging sheetrock and things we had actually heard of when you're building a house, like the framing. We never imagined the foundation in these early standing planning stages. It never crossed our mind that we would spend two months slogging through mud hauling concrete blocks. We never considered that. We learned it in a hurry, but by then we were, we had already made the commitment and not just this emotional commitment that this is something we need um, and that this is something that's going to bring us together as a family, but we'd made a financial commitment. I bought all of the supplies and I couldn't afford to just pay people to put the whole thing together for us. You got a bank to give you money. I did. To build a house. That whole housing crisis thing, I could have contributed. This was right <laughs> during that time. If you wondered why we were in this housing crisis. Crazy loan officers. They would give money to anyone. <laughs> Literally. This is proof. Because you had, you had plans. I had plans uh, that Drew and I made. Do you remember that? We just, I got a huge, about four foot sheet of paper I and a long ruler and started just drawing out With as a pencil. as I could. <laughs> just plans for a house, uh, where the windows, doors would be, the walls, the thickness of the walls, everything, and gave it to her, and she took it to the bank. It was drawn in pencil still at the right, bank. Right, right, and we made several different versions, and we were really careful. You know, we were trying to plan the plumbing already, because we knew that I would be the plumber, so we were trying to think of things like you know, well, we know it'll be easier if this bathroom is, you know, to have the water coming through the walls that would be one bathroom over the other. So we were trying to plan those things at least a little bit um, as we were going. So, I mean, it's not as though there was no thought into it at all. We certainly put a lot of thought in it. We were watching YouTube. We were looking at house plans. And we considered buying house plans, but they were all so complex. We didn't even know what all the lines meant. Um, and we needed something very simple. We needed a house that was, you know, a rectangle, um, that was a big box. So that was one of the reasons that we drew it, in order to keep it simple. It didn't have a really steep roof line or anything complex. It was a box. Tell me about your decision to put this all into a book form and to include some of those things that your family didn't even know all the stories about. Yeah, some of the stories in there that kids didn't know until they read the book. Um, and I spent six years trying to write it. Um, 
I guess, gaining the courage to tell it the right way. I wrote a dozen or more versions of it. And the very early versions were just about us building the house. It was very Hallmark Channel happiness. And, you know, everybody kept asking why. Um, my agents and when editors would see it, they'd say, why did you do this? Like, there's no sane reason. So it was very clear that I had to include some of the dark stuff, some of the bad stuff that had put us in that position. And then it was weaving all of that in and honestly just getting the guts to say it, to say, hey, I made some really bad mistakes, some really big mistakes with huge consequences to me and huge consequences to my kids. And you know, to own that, to own that history and then say, well, this is how I tried to pull it all back together. Um, you know, there's no instruction manual for this stuff, especially when there is a person with, you know, schizophrenia involved. There's no easy way to get through all of this. Um, so here's what we did, and we're still not perfect by any stretch. Um, and we have plenty of little squabbles and, and things, but it's a way that we became a closer family and that we healed through this. And I just learned that so many people, not necessarily domestic violence, but are in this position where they need to start a life over, but they don't know how to take this leap, and they're trying all these little bitty things. And I kept giving people this advice, well, do something big. Um, and then it, it came to, I have to write this and share it, I have to tell it, even though it's still hard every time I have to get up and say even just what I said there, here's the really, really dumb things I did in my life. And y'all may not have known all what was going on, but you knew enough. Um, and so as, as she comes to you with, hey, let's build a house, and you all agree, which again is kind of... A, Trust your mother. Uh -huh. <laughs> did, you know, did you feel as well for yourself that it was a, a, a bigger project than just the house? That it was the, you know... I wanted a bedroom that was my own. That was pretty much it for me. It that was, was your motivation? At, at the time, yeah. We... We are a close family, but we might not be if we had to share bedrooms. <laughs> so to, to us, to the kids, I mean, as three teenage kids, I literally think our biggest motivation was no way are we sharing a room. Because otherwise, like she said, we could have bought a small house somewhere with the same amount of money from the bank, but we would have to share bedrooms and we might not all live through it. So that was a huge reasoning for me. I think too that there's a lot to be said for giving your kids permission to hit things really hard after they've been through that kind of hell. After, you know, to give them the power, to put a power tool in their hands and let them cut something. Um, even I think if they weren't aware of the healing that that does, there's, there's some value in that. And in that, you know, you have been paralyzed in, in this position of tiptoeing through your life for a full decade. Now here, take this hammer and you can literally build yourself a bigger life, a better life. I think there was, there was a lot of value in that. Drew, you were a fan of the power tools? Oh yeah, the nail gun especially. <laughs> I'd frame out a huge wall and uh, put 10 or, t 10 or 12 nails in, a, in one spot so it would really hold. And I was all, Drew, we don't need Swiss cheese out of that piece of lumber. The more dangerous that my mom made a power tool feel, the more Drew liked it. So there may have even been some reverse psychology going on there. I don't know. But if it felt dangerous, if she was slightly worried, Drew was all in. How many times did you guys hear, if it falls, let it go? <laughs> Quite a few. When lifting a, like, especially on the second story, when lifting a wall up, it wasn't nailed to anything, so if it started falling off, we would fall down with it, so we'd just let it go, and we would build another one if it did fall. But I don't think that ever happened. No, we didn't fall. <laughs> and we didn't drop any walls either. Yeah. But. <laughs> and I don't know whether or not this is just, Carrie, you not wanting DHS to show up, but you're the only one that got hurt in the book, and you got hurt a lot, and very seriously. And did it, I mean, Roman, we all had Roman got hurt right. once. The Roman, hospital trips. Yeah, Roman though. got a cut on his lip. Yeah. Um, but, and two by four. He was actually teeter tottering on a two by four and it hit him in the lip. But I don't think any, I mean, not even enough to leave a scar. I don't think anybody else got hurt. She was the only ER. Trip. But I was also the one who was going to take the biggest risks. Um, I was doing the cutting while they were doing the measuring. I did most of the cutting. Drew, later in the, in the build, Drew would use the skill saw and stuff mo more. 
I did but, get a, a wood splinter in my left eye. That wasn't fun. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, you, that you had a, a, a concrete pole through your calf yeah, as well as a metal pole, yeah. Um, Scar the head, right head and to your arm. And, and yeah, and there's plenty of little marks. <laughs> it it's it was a when you tell this story one of the times you went to the ER and you have the the um, therapist come and talk to you. Yes. Um, and it was kind of a poignant moment because this is you <laughs> trying to do something and yet they just now kind of pick up on it. Yeah, and, you know, of course they thought that I had been abused because I came into the ER and, of course, I had a, a cut above my eye and my hand was horribly bruised. A, a piece of plywood had hit me in the head. And... They thought that I had, was a victim of domestic violence, which was so ironic, because here I was finally escaping it. And it had shocked me how many years I had had bruises, that I had had bruises from domestic violence, that I had worn turtlenecks, even in the summer. I was buying sleeveless shirts with turtlenecks to hide the bruises on my neck. But nobody had ever noticed. Nobody had ever said anything. I had fingerprint bruises on my arms. And no one had ever said, oh, you know, maybe you're being abused. But then here I am, escaping it, and, and that's the first time anybody ever said, wait, something might be wrong, so it was ironic. All right, we'll go through kind of the process of the, the house now. Um, you mentioned the foundation, but it was a lot longer and a lot harder than you thought. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, when you see, the reason why you said earlier is we didn't even think about the foundation is because when you see people do it professionally, you only see it for about two days because that's about how long it takes them. For us, it was more like two months, right? right. Yeah. So that was one of the big differences. <laughs> that, that's why the foundation, I mean, all of these things that we didn't think about, every co professional construction crews who are, you know, have three times, four times, I don't even know how many people are in a construction crew, but quite a few more people than us breeze through these things that took us forever doing six times. And yeah, that was... You know, and we, also, we built on a hill, so it was a more complex foundation than we had Googled. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we had to try to figure out how to do that. And there are lots of different ways to do it. We didn't pick the best one. If I were doing this again, I would not do it that way. And then I had a plumber who was a real idiot, and of course that was me. And he didn't know how to get the water hooked up to the city main. So, you know, it was December, and through January, we're doing a foundation of 1,500 concrete block for a block and fill foundation, if anybody cares, um, which means it's a whole bunch of gray concrete blocks piled up. They're almost eight feet tall in the front um, because of the hill. And then you pack them full of Donafil, which is a powdery gray substance, which we shoveled by hand, almost 26 small dump truck loads. Um, so it was a tremendous amount of work. And because of my bad plumbing skills, and mostly that was cowardice, because I was afraid to drill under the street, because if it collapsed, that was on me. And the, the water was on the other side of the street. So we were mixing the mortar for this entire foundation in a wheelbarrow. Where did we get the water, Drew? <laughs> a pond. <laughs> I'd just get a, a bucket full at a time of water and carry it to the wheelbarrow, put a little bit in, and it was... Two. <laughs> <laughs> Jada, um, what were you doing? Mixing. Oh, and laying the mortar. Yeah. <laughs> Jada had a little trowel that was like, a, was like a pie server, and we would mix the mortar in the wheelbarrow, and we'd dump it onto what I called her pallet, which was a big um, sheet wood. of plywood and carry it over, you know, dump the wheelbarrow load on there, and Jada had her little pie server trowel, and she would trowel the, the mortar out at 11, and um, then we'd set the concrete blocks on behind her. And Roman played in the... Roman, what were you doing? Playing. Yeah. Sleeping. <laughs> he was the Donafil king, that gray powdery substance. Um, he made sure we had that everywhere. <laughs> He's so happy when we find it. What? You're happy oh. when we find the Donovan. <laughs> I play in it all the yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, we still will be like digging a hole somewhere and, uh, you know, I'll be planting a tree or something on our property and I'm like, oh, there's a whole bunch of Donovan because we spread it out before we, you know, planted grass. So it'll be like a, six inches under the ground and he's like, oh, let me see. He still wants to touch the Donovan. <laughs> 
And he knew how to say Donafil at two years old, yeah. which is the cutest and weirdest thing ever. <laughs> Uh, who were Tweedledee and Tweedledum? <laughs> well, we'll leave those names. We won't give them names. Of course, the, the city wouldn't allow us to do everything. I was able to do my plumbing. I ran my own gas lines. And we had to hire the electric done and the HVAC. Um, you have to have a licensed person do those. So I hired a couple of electricians. And naturally, I went with the really low end of price for the electricians. And you kind of get what you pay for. Um, they had a falling out kind of most very early in the job, so they wouldn't both show up at the same time. Um, they, they liked smoking marijuana, so the cloud would come out of their car when they'd arrive. <laughs> they made a couple of mistakes that we still curse them for. <laughs> a couple of things that don't work very well at all. And, um, and we had to constantly wait for them. So that was the most frustrating thing, I think. When, we, when it was on, on us, like we could take it. You know, it's our fault that this isn't getting done. Um, but it was when we had to wait for someone else and it was holding things up. And Tweedledum and Tweedledee held things up a lot. Caroline and Benjamin? Uh, yeah, the, there were so many things that I was going through when I built this house. And of course I was extremely stressed. And I went back to a meditation that my mom had taught me when I was pretty young. And it was just a, a relaxation thing with, you know, sort of a, a light and heat. Um, but this time when I did it, when we were building the house, one of the first times I went back to it, there was somebody there. Um, and I still do this. I still meditate. And there is always somebody there. And... Um, and I think I say this in the book too, that somebody had told me that that, you know, that that will happen and that is your true self. And I'm like, well, it's this older black guy who has no teeth, you know, <laughs> but okay. That's my, my true spirit self. Um, I'll go with that. But it was a, and, and his name was Benjamin and it was always there. Um, he was there every time I meditated, uh, just sitting there silently and it was always a very peaceful thing. Um, and I, it, was a, it was something I didn't include in the book, the first few versions that I wrote, um, but it was something that helped me through, so ultimately I did. And I also included Caroline, which was a different sort of a, a spirit guide. Um, and in the book I manifest her a bit more as a single entity, where in my reality I was constantly thinking of, there are so many other women who have gone through this and other tough things. And I felt constantly like I was a part of this greater sense of humanity, of all these women, and that their spirits were with me and sort of helping empower me through this. Um, and I felt like I had to give a name to that because it was a very strong feeling that instead of feeling isolated as I had for so many years going through this abuse, that for the first time in my life, e even though I was still completely alone, it was still just me and the kids, for the first time in my life, I felt this connectedness to all of humanity and specifically to women. Um, and so I gave that a name in the book and I called her Caroline. How did you keep, how are you such an optimist? You go through so many times and you say it so many times. It, I don't know if it's, like, you, know, you, you have to keep saying it to believe it. <laughs> no, but, it's like for real. Right. And one thing that I kind of saw was you always wanted to move forward. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of as well. It, it didn't matter if it was hanging one door or right. you know, laying the foundation, it was move progress, go forward. Yeah, and I have tried not to be an optimist. My kids aren't all as optimistic as I am. Probably Drew I is the most, um, and Jada has some of it. But yeah. Hope and Roman, no. The, the oldest and youngest <laughs> Opposite. don't have that, but mine is extre more extreme than theirs, for sure. Um, I don't know. I, I, I've tried to not be that way because I think that it's gotten me into some bad situations to always think it can be better, um, to always think, well, you know, this is just temporary, and, and now tomorrow I'm going to wake up and it's going to be great. I always feel that way. I always get up every day thinking, well, this one's, you know, this is all going to happen today. Um, and it doesn't matter how much evidence piles up to the contrary, um, I still wake up feeling that way. So it gets me still into some some interesting projects. The kids and I still do a lot of DIY projects. And I think this is where me and Roman come in because somebody <laughs> has to be the realist who's 
like, wait a minute. You want to build a concrete structure for your front yard. Maybe instead of starting out with a five or eight foot concrete head that's like one of those island things. Where was the inspiration from? Do you remember? The Easter Island head? Yeah. So maybe instead of making a five or eight foot one, since you've never done anything like this, why don't you start with one that's about the height of this chair? Well, actually, I think you just said miniature. And I think you were thinking yeah. little and we went. Yeah. 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 It was about the height of this chair. Um, yeah, and I, that's, I think, the very much the forward part of it. Uh, I'll come up with an idea for something, like a, I wanted to build a card catalog for my, my den, a big cabinet, out of some reclaimed lumber that we had. So I drew a sketch on a post-it note and then went out to the shop and started pulling the lumber. And I'm like, well, let's start cutting. And the kids are like, well, maybe we could, especially Drew, maybe we could have some more detailed plans and numbers attached to this thing. Um, but it's always that way. It's always, oh, I want to make some artwork for the wall. I've got time to go to Lowe's. And I literally am at Lowe's and calling Hope and saying, can you measure that really quick for me? I'm laying it out on the floor in Lowe's, and I think I have what I need. Or when we decided to build a whole little bookshelf with right. built-in cabinets underneath, and we kind of measured, wrote down a few numbers, borrowed a friend's van, drove to Lowe's, bought a bunch of wood, brought well, it, it worked back out. home. Except we forgot to buy, like, the counter. Or the whole top. Yeah, the whole top of it. That part. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's always just... We decided to do it, and we went to the store, and we bought the supplies. Right. I always am and very... Let's just keep moving forward. Um, I don't know that you can stomp that out of my personality at this point. I think no, it's No, even if you try really hard. <laughs> or use logic. And I know that you have kind of struggled with... Is it was it worth the lost time and was it worth the missed this and that? Um, but you did share something that Drew said to Jada, and it was uh, you built your own damn house. You can do anything. When it comes to DIY projects, I'm just like my mom, wanting to make them bigger and bigger. Oh. <laughs> Do you remember um, when we finished the house? I don't think any of us thought right away it was worth it. It wasn't a, a celebratory time. Um, we immediately had a huge family crisis that followed building the house um, in that my mom passed away the day that we moved in. So I think that we were still really struggling with that evaluation of we have just gone through this enormous physical pain. Now let's follow it with this emotional pain. We still have all this stuff to do. We had to then go remodel my mom's house. We remodeled all the rental properties we had and sold them. So it, the work didn't end. Um, it just kept going and going. And I know that for months after, we were still in that space of, was this worth it? Like, OK, we have a house. Um, but yeah, for me, it was, it was that moment when Jada was struggling with middle school problems. And, um, and she kept saying, I can't, I can't. And then Drew just, he just put an end to it and said, you built your own damn house. You can do anything. Do you guys remember when, like, did you have a realization of, oh, it was worth it? Because I know we had talked about it not feeling worth it for a while. Did you guys have, like, a moment? I now, lo I now know how to build a house, and I want to build my own house one day. And I have all the the code up in my head, like what needs to be what, the codes that need to be met to build a house, and how to plumb, do framing, everything. So I think it was definitely worth it for me. I don't know. I mean, I never. I feel like I, during it, I didn't feel like it wasn't worth it because it was fun and I was 11 and it was fun to be on a construction site and do siding and framing. But then um, it also, I mean, it sucked not getting to hang out with friends. And, but I don't know, I never felt like it wasn't worth it. I was young and dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was worth it until other people started telling me how cool it was. <laughs> and like, whoa, you built a house? And once I realized that other people were really impressed with it, I was like, well, maybe that is not a normal thing. Maybe that is actually a cool thing. And then I think I liked it because other people thought it was cool. Honestly, I think that was a huge part of what made me think it was, well, I guess it is. 
different and not normal. Yeah, because we certainly house. didn't look at it that way as we were building. We didn't think, oh, we're doing this. It, it was it was slogging through the mud. It wasn't glamorous. That's why we didn't take pictures. All of the pictures that we have are pictures that my mom and my dad took at times that they visited. Um, first of all, if anybody would have had a camera, I would have, you know, of course we had digital cameras at home, but if they would have brought them, you know, they would have been in trouble. All hands on deck, you know. <laughs> we didn't have time to stand around and take pictures. And none of us were having great hair days out there either, so we probably... <laughs> Um, but it wasn't a thing that we thought we would want to remember. It wasn't, you know, it was a really tough time in our lives. It was an emotionally difficult time. It's physically difficult. We didn't think, oh, we're going to want to look back on this. Um, but thank goodness my parents knew better and took pictures. I'm so glad we have them. And you end, end the book with, um, with the saying, this story, our story, was never about a house. Yeah, um, so many people ask me, in fact this morning I did a radio show in Cleveland and that's one of the things they said is, and I get this in almost every interview, is you'd never move, right? You'd never leave that house and that always surprises me a little bit. I, I feel a little bit of attachment to it obviously and it's really cool to live in a house that you built, um, but that was never the point. Um, it's just a house. And everything that we got, everything that that gave us, we all still have. We take it with us. You know, the oldest three have, have moved out and back in and out. And every place that they've gone, they've had all of those lessons, everything with them. So, in, you know, right down to things about fixing the plumbing in other places or whatever. Um, but certainly the more emotional things, that's, that's what it was about. Um, the kids and I needed to build the house more than we needed a physical house. Uh, we're about to open up for questions, but real quick, I wanted each of you to give a one-word descriptor of your mom. Inspirational. Powerful. Brave. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Will you go back and give one for your kids? Oh, wow. Oh, there's so many. You can use the same word for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to mix it up because I'm going to say the first ones that come to me. For Hope, I think bold. Um, for Jada, I think like original and powerful. Um, for Drew, gosh, so creative. It's that creative optimist thing. Both. I'm going to. I get to say two words because they're my kids. <laughs> um, and for Roman, it's the creativity and the three words, attention to detail. That's a lot of words. He pays so much attention to everything. He does YouTube videos, but he doesn't watch other YouTube videos. He dissects them. So it's just his attention to it. What, what's your YouTube channel? Give a shout out. <laughs> <laughs> It, just my name. <laughs> Roman Prickett, my name. Check it out. Roman's last name is Prickett. The rest of us are Brickens, so he's at Roman Prickett. You're supposed to say like and subscribe and follow for more or something like that. Right? <laughs> All right. If you have any questions, raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Right over here. Where did you live when you were building this home? I lived in a house that I had had built a few years before. It was a big house. It was expensive. I couldn't afford to stay in it. Um, both of the, the bad relationships I had been in, I had been saddled with a lot of debt um, that came from the men that I was with. So I had a great job. I was a, a programmer analyst for the city of Little Rock, so I had a good income. And I was working the entire time we built the house. I was still working full-time writing computer software. And um, yeah, so we lived in that house. It was up for sale. So we lived both in fear that it would not sell and that it would. <laughs> and it did take some time it took to some sell. Time, and, right. And you had to, you finished, they finished in like September, October? Yeah, we finished in September. Or bank loan finish, but mm -hmm. you still had stuff to do. And then it was almost to the next spring. Yeah, we moved in in March of 2009. The construction loan ended in September of 2008. So then we had months, um, the last three months, we were still finishing things like closet shelves and towel holders. Um, and then the, the early months of 2009, we were just waiting for that house to sell and paying stuff on both houses. 
right up here. I should say that was about six miles away too, so we were going about six miles between the job site and where we lived. I was just, I was just wondering if any of you uh, wanted to do this for a living now, if you wanted to be an architect or an engineer or a contractor or anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, getting into that creative side of building things like that, I started to take uh, some engineering classes and decided this wasn't for me. Um, but I did like the aspect of design, so now I'm going for um, industrial design or product design. I'm just making things in 3D and 3D printing them out. I like seeing uh, my physical creations like come to life like that. So it really helped me find my way. All the way here, he was giving us specs on a 3D printer he was looking at. <laughs> what about you, Dana? No, Drew's the only one. <laughs> no. Pad you, bum. First off, thank you all for coming out. Really just enjoyed hearing your story. And relating to that, like something I personally love is just the human condition and stories about how people live life. And I guess my question to y'all is, certainly everything you described was, was not easy. It took a lot of time. And there were likely a lot of moments that would just perk up uh, where it would be very tough to keep going, where there might be those questions even maybe pairing off in private conversations about should we keep going, should we stop, what should we do? My question is, how did you kind of find your perseverance? How did you kind of keep going through those hard times? Uh, because it, it, again, it was slogging through mud. It was, you know, your family alone kind of taking this on. A powerful story, but not easy. So how did you, how did you keep going? How did you find those moments? Well, part of that was just that fact that I wake up every day thinking I got this. Um, but no, there were definitely so many moments. And the, the biggest reason we kept going is that we didn't have another option. I mean, that was it. We had removed the plan B. Um, and sometimes that's the best thing you can do for yourself. If you want to ac accomplish something big, sabotage that plan B, and now you got no choice. Um, you have to push forward. But as a parent, the other thing was there were all these little people watching me and waiting. And if I folded for a second, if I was vulnerable, if I had this any doubts at all, the whole thing would fall apart, and there was nobody else to pull it together. So it was a constant awareness of whether I know what I have to do next or not, I darn well better pretend I do. Um, to the extreme of, you know, we're trying to figure out how to put a, a, a diagonal wall together and we can't figure it out and everybody's getting really frustrated and I would say, I think I've got it, hand me that board. And I would make a random cut in a board knowing full well this was not the right way to do it. But it was action. It was moving us forward even if it's just one more step in a wrong direction. Um, I'm thinking, well, the whole time I'm cutting it, now how should I be doing this? You know, it was just all about con keeping continual forward momentum. And it was, it was that looking at the, the alternative also. Um, if we don't build this house, then what? Um, we're going to rent a little two-bedroom apartment and stack bunk beds in it. And then my kids go through life thinking, you know, the only solution is retreat. They were already so small. They'd already seen so many bad things. We had to do something big. Um, and I'm a little bit stubborn. And I think me and Drew were old enough to understand the burden of the financial impact that this would have if we didn't follow it through. We probably didn't fully understand what a bank loan meant at 17 and 16, but we knew it was money that had to be paid back. And we knew that our creation was worth nothing if it was not finished. So I, I do think that, you know, for Roman and Jada at 11 and 2, they were just along for the ride in that regard. But I do think that me and Drew felt that pressure of this is a real financial thing that we have to make happen. Yeah. <laughs> it was really stressful, too. And we had a lot of humor going into it. We'd laugh quite a bit if we messed something up. We'd pull it out. Uh, a few of the times we couldn't even pull it out and redo it. We were laughing so hard. We had to cry, so we were laughing so hard and get, wait a few minutes to go back into it. 
Yeah, Drew and I both have a pretty ridiculous sense of humor, and we can sort of get on the same wavelength to where whatever we're doing, someone will just sort of grunt and look at something, and we both get it, and nobody else does, and we can't pull it together. Um, yeah, there was a lot of that. But there was, there was a lot of pressure for the kids. Um, and I'm not sure what drove them forward other than the hell that they'd been through and this opportunity to, to take action. I originally had two questions, but he just asked one of them, so that made it real easy. Uh, it, I hope I don't get this wrong, but True and Hope's grandfather, I believe, is the, the, from Wisconsin, is the one that would be Kara's father. Okay. Uh, go into as much or little detail as you want, but it's my understanding that your father has some frugal ways about him that some might consider charming, uh, and I'm, wonder if you, I'm wondering if you guys would share a couple of those stories, and then do you think that the way he is had anything to do with what, what you've ended up doing here? Yeah, my dad is a character. Um, in fact, he'll be here in a couple of weeks. We were so wishing he could have been here for this. Uh, he has multiple sclerosis, so his health is, is poor, but he made it down to help with building the house several times. And yeah, he, he can't pass up a good deal. He lives extremely frugal. Um, and one of the things he does that's really frugal with food is if he finds something, you know, you'll have like bananas that are going bad at the grocery store, so they will sell you like two bushels of them. Well, they're practically free, so you have to buy all of those and bring them home. So, and he, I mean, he does this with everything from, you know, a, there's a deal on plastic bags. We have enough plastic bags to last a lifetime. Um, in fact, this last year, last summer when he came down, it was plantains. So we had a garbage bag, like a leaf garbage bag of plantains. And he had never tasted a plantain. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and nor did he know if he really liked them or how to cook them. He found out he really didn't like them. Right. And but, did we. but we would eat them anyhow because... He doesn't he, care who likes them. Right, so I made like chocolate cake out of plantains and of course I fried them into like pancake patties a million different these were very ripe pan plantains I should mention um, but and it, you know it could be carrots you'll have like a, a this huge basket of carrots and find all the things you should make out of those um, but and it just translates into a thousand different things with my dad and from his parents as well they never threw anything away it was always that fixing it repairing it and I certainly gained a lot of that uh, German heritage in Wisconsin, it was it was very, of course, the Great Depression. Um, you know that my grandparents taught him that uh, from that that scarcity. So yeah, I think that it's always been a let's see what we can make ourselves. My parents made things themselves. My parents dug a swimming pool for us, a full size swimming pool when I was a kid, um, and put a rubber liner in it and built a house over it. So in Wisconsin, we had an indoor swimming pool, thirteen foot, right? Um, uh, it was eight feet deep. No, only eight. Eight feet deep, yeah, and it was 16 by 32 feet, and it was a full-size swimming pool. Um, we couldn't really afford to heat it and use it very often, and even in the summer in Wisconsin, you have to be able to heat a pool. Uh, but yeah, I grew up with this idea of constantly DIYing stuff, of making stuff, and and of remaking stuff. Uh, and my parents even buying new stuff, both of them were remaking it and improving it. Uh, my dad improves my lawnmower every time he comes. So it's like a 12-step process to start it. And it involves jumper cables. Car batteries. A spray can of gasoline that you have to spray through this garden hose that's hooked into the carburetor. And then there's this lever you turn that actually lets the gas through the pipe. And then, oh, you have to lean harder on your right cheek than your left because he disabled this thing in the seat. My dad's, my dad's a great character. And he may be watching tonight. I hope he is. My lawnmower needs you. Grandpa Bruce. <laughs> the official term. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's wonderful that, you know, that's something that I wouldn't trade that for anything. When we were building the house, one, one time somebody came by that was going to help us. And it was a strong guy, and he was like, I'll come by and I'll help you for the afternoon, because we were in a time crunch. Um, it was just before we closed on the loan, and there were a million things left to do. And he would like follow me around and try to do what I was doing, and I'm like, well, here's, 
we just need to complete these tasks. Like, just pick one and do it. And he's like, I don't know how to do any of those things. And I was like, well, neither do I. <laughs> like, I don't know how to do any one of these things. I'm like making it up as I go. And it had never crossed his mind that you could accomplish something that way. And it had never crossed my mind that everybody didn't do that. I just thought, you go into it thinking, I'm going to figure it out while I go. Um, and I always have done that and always will. And I think YouTube culture has kind of made more people do that now mm -hmm. and has made more people see that they now have access to this information on the internet. And even Roman, having grown up in our family, even though he was only two at the time, he now finds things on YouTube all the time that look cool, even if they involve like melting metal or what is to make yeah, swords or something? Make what is that? A forge? Forge. forge. For, I don't know he's trying to means. talk me into making a forge in the backyard so he can make some swords. Because he sees it on YouTube and he believes he can do anything because of this. But I think so many people do now with YouTube. Mm -hmm. We got time for one more question. All right. One second. One second. I work for the Parks Department worked for the Parks Department for 40 years, and we had a workhorse system um, for about 20 years, and there was complicated and all that stuff. And look at these dates. Like, while all this was going on, CARE was rewriting the park workhorse mm -hmm. system and to make it user-friendly to where we could all use it, and she did a fantastic job. And uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You can also search, you know, the Democrat Gazette and find the articles that Kara was writing as well uh, as a freelancer. So she did a lot for sure. This is not a question. I just want to tell you, I'm from Wisconsin, and you make me proud to be a Badger. Oh, thank you. Well, Kara and family, you did great for the first time on stage together. I think we can take it on the road show, right? traveling, uh, do it. Um, Rise is available over here. It's, it really is a great book. Um, it's inspirational, it's moving, it's informative, funny, um, some suspenseful, there's some suspense in it as well. So it's, it's a very good book. Uh, please, please pick it up and come visit with her. Thanks again. Thank all of you for coming out.